Aurelian. Written by Aaron Dembski Bowden. Narrated by Six Paths Kyokan. Prologue. Herald of the One God. Colchis, many years ago. The archpriest watched from the cathedral window as his city burned below. We should do something. His voice was a bass rumble yet edged by a softness that smoothed his words into something almost delicate. His was a voice made to reason, to question, to reassure, not to scream and froth and rage. The archpriest turned from the window. Father, when will the fires stop burning? Corfaron walked across the chamber, his wizened scowl deep set on his face, like a scar cut into old leather. He busied himself with the scrolls on the central table, his thin lips moving as he read each one in turn. Father, we cannot remain here while the city burns. We must help the people. You have not spoken since we claimed the Cathedral of Illumination, the aging man glanced over the merest moment. And your first words after winning this war are to ask when the fires will be drowned. You have just conquered a world, boy. You have greater matters to concern yourself with. The archpriest was a young man, beautiful in a way that transcended notions of physical attraction. His tanned skin gleamed with tiny tattoos of gold inked scripture. His eyes were dark without being cold, and he could spend days without smiling, yet never seem sinister. He turned back to the window. In his mind's eye, he had always pictured the crusade's end in this very place. The avenues of the city of grey flowers flooded by cheering crowds, their joyous prayers reaching into the skies, shaking the slender towers of their former rulers. The reality didn't quite approach it. The streets were crowded, that much was true, but crowded with rioters, looters and clashing bands of robed warriors, as the last lingering remnants of the Covenant's defenders fought to the last against the tide of invaders. So much of the city is still aflame, the Archpriest said. We must do something. Corferin murmured to himself as he read the tattered parchments. Father. The archpriest turned again, watching the older priest discard another scroll. Mm. What is it, boy? Half of the city is ablaze. We must do something. Corferin smiled, the expression ugly but not unkind. You must prepare for your coronation, Lorga. The covenant has fallen and the old ways will be cast down as blasphemy against the One God. You are not merely an Archpriest of the Godswan. You are the Archpriest of all of Colchis. I have given you a world. The golden figure turned back to the window, eyes narrowed. Something crept into his voice then, something rigid and cold, a foreshadowing of all that would be in the centuries to come. I do not wish to rule, he said. That will change, my son. It will change when you see that no one else around you is as fit to rule as you are. In a moment of realization, it will change out of your own selfless need. That is how it always works for men of power. The road to every throne is paved with good intentions. Lorgar shook his head. I wish for nothing more than our own people to see the truth. The truth is power. The other priest went back to the scrolls. The ignorant and the weak must be dragged into the light no matter the cost. It doesn't matter how many bleed and cry out on the way. Lorgar watched the city burn, seeing his followers slaughter the last of the old ways blasphemers in the streets below. I know I've asked you many times before, he said softly, but does it not give you pause, even as the crusade ends? You once believed as they do. I still believe as they do, Corferin gave an assured smile, but I believe as you do as well. I keep to my old faith that there are many gods, Lorgar. Your one god is simply the most powerful. He will come to us soon. The archpriest looked to the darkening sky. Colchis was a thirsty world, and rain clouds rarely made a call in the heavens. Perhaps a year from now, but no longer. I've seen it in my dreams. On the day he arrives, his vessel will descend through a storm. Corferin came closer resting his hand on the taller man's forearm. When your one god comes, we will see if I was right to believe you. Lorgar was still staring up at the blue sky, 
watching it become choked by the rising smoke from the burning city. He smiled at his mentor's words. Have faith, father. Corfaron smiled then. I have always had faith, my son. Have you ever dreamed of this god's name? The masses will ask for it soon enough. I cannot help but wonder what you will tell them. I do not believe he has a name. Lorgar closed his eyes. We will know him only as the Emperor. Part 1. The Seventeenth Son. Chapter 1. Fraternity. The Vengeful Spirit. Four days after Istvan V. Eight of his brothers were present, though only half of them truly stood in the room. The absent four were nothing more than projections. Three of them manifested around the table in the forms of flickering grey hololithic simulcra, formed of stuttering light and white noise. The fourth of them appeared as a brighter image comprised of silver radiance, its features and limbs dripping spiral lashes of corpus and witch fire. This last projection, Magnus, inclined its head in greeting. Hail Lorgar, his brother bred the words within his mind. Lorgar nodded in return. How far away are you, Magnus? The Crimson King's psychic projection showed no emotion. A tall man, his head crested by a sculpted crown. Magnus the Red refused to make contact with his one remaining eye. Very far. I lick my wounds on a distant world. It has no name but that which I brought to it. Lorgar nodded, not to blind the nuances of hesitation in his brother's silent tones. Now was not the time for such talk. The others acknowledged him one by one. Kurz, a cadaverous, pulsing, hololithic avatar of himself, gave the barest suggestion of a nod. Mortarion, an emaciated wraith even in the flesh, was hardly improved by this electronic etherealness. His image faded in and out of focus, occasionally dividing in the bizarre mitosis of distant distortion. He lowered the blade of his Man Reaper scythe in greeting, which was in itself a warmer hail than Lorgar had been expecting. Alpharius was the last of those present through long-range sending. He stood helmed while all others were bareheaded, and his hololithic image was stable while each of the others suffered corruption from the vast ranges between their fleets. Alpharius, almost a head shorter than his brothers, stood scaled in crocodilian resplendence, his reptile skin armor plating glinting in the false light of his manifestation. His salute was the sign of the Aquila, the Emperor's own symbol, made with both hands across his breastplate. Lorgar snorted. How quaint. You're late, one of his brothers interrupted. We've been waiting. The voice was a graceless avalanche of syllables. Angron. Lorgar turned to him, dispensing with any attempt at a conciliatory smile. His warrior brother stood hunched in the threatening lean that characterized his body language. The back of his skull malformed with the brutal neural implants hammered into the bone and wired into the soft tissue of his brainstem. Angron's bloodshot eyes narrowed as another pulse of pain ransacked through his nervous system. A legacy of the aggression enhancers surgically imposed upon him by his former masters. While the other Primarchs had risen to rule the worlds they'd been cast down upon, only Angron had languished in captivity. A slave to techno-primitives on some forsaken backwater world that never deserved a name. Angron's past still ran through his blood, nerve pain barking in his muscles with every misfired synapse. I was delayed, Lorgar admitted. He didn't like to look at his brother for too long at a time. It was one of the things that made Angron twitch, like an animal. The Lord of the World Eaters couldn't abide being stared at, and could never hold eye contact for more than a few moments. Lorgar had no desire to provoke him. Corferon had once made mention that the World Eater's face was a sneering mask made of clenched knuckles but Lorgar found no humour in it. To his eyes, his brother was a cracked statue. Features that should have been composed and handsome were wrenched into a jagged, snarling expression, flawed by muscle twinges that bordered on spasms. It was easy to see why others believed Angron always looked on the edge of fury. In truth, he looked like a man struggling to concentrate through epileptic agony. Lorgar hated the bleak, crude bastard but it was hard not to admire his unbreakable endurance. Angron grunted something wordless and dismissive, looking back at the others. It's been nine days, 
and we know our tasks, he growled. We are already spread across the void. Why did you gather us? Horus, war master of the cleaved Imperium, didn't answer immediately. He gestured for Lorgard to take his place around the table at Horus' own right hand. Unlike his legion's sea-green ceramite, Horus stood clad in layered, dense armor of charcoal black, adorned with the glaring cadmium eye of terror on his breastplate. This last sigil, the symbol of his authority as master of the Imperium's armies, had its black core refashioned into a slitted serpent's pupil. Lorgar wondered, as he met Horus's pale, elegant smirk, just what secrets Erebus had been whispering into the War Master's ears in recent months. Lorgar took his place between Horus and Perturabo. The former presided at the head of the table, all pretense of equality done away with in the aftermath of Istvan. The latter stood in his burnished, riveted warplate, leaning on the haft of an immense hammer with an admirable air of casual disregard. Lorgar, Perturabo murmured in greeting, two dozen power cables of various thickness plugged directly into the Iron Warrior's bare head, even at the jawline and temples, linking him to the internal processes of his gunmetal grey armour. Change draped over the tiered plating rattled as he gave a cursory nod. Lorgar returned it, but said nothing. His dark eyes drifted across the others, seeking his last brother. So, Horace's indulgent smile was all teeth. We have gathered again, at last. All eyes fell upon him, except for Lorgar's. The seventeenth son's distraction went unmarked as Horace continued. This gathering is the first of its kind. Here, now, we unite in one another's presence for the first time. We gathered on Istvan, Angron grunted. Not all of us. Alpharius's colourless hololithic image still hadn't turned its helmeted face. The projection's voice held little in the way of corruption crackle, and just as little emotion. The nine legions had scattered after Istvan. With a galaxy to conquer and great armies to raise on the long road to Tara, the legions loyal to the Warmaster Horus broke apart into the void, boosting away from a world left dead in their wake. Angron narrowed his eyes, as if fighting to remember. He nodded agreement a moment later. True. Lorgar refused to come. He was praying. Horus, his handsome features lit from the low glow of his gorget, offered a smile. He was meditating on his place in our great plan. There is a difference, brother. Angron nodded again without really committing to agreement. He seemed to care for nothing but shrugging the conversation from his shoulders and moving on to other matters. Horus spoke up again. We all know the costs of the coming campaign and our destinies within it. Our fleets are underway, but after the, shall we say, unpleasantness of Istvan, this is the first time we have gathered as a full fraternity, Horus gestured, with an open palm to his golden-skinned brother. Intentionally or not, the movement was threatening when made with the massive clawed Mechanicum Talon sheathing his right hand. I hope your meditations were worthwhile, Lorgar. Lorgar was still staring at his final brother, he had not taken his eyes off the last figure since he'd looked away from Perturabo. Lorga? Horace almost growled now. I am growing ever more weary of your inability to adhere to established planning. Kurz's chuckle was a vulture's caw. Even Angon smiled, his scarred lips peeling back from several replacement iron teeth. Lorga slowly, slowly reached for the ornate Crozius mace on his back. As he drew the weapon in the company of his closest kin, his eyes remained locked on one of them, and all physically present felt the deepening chill of psychic frost rhyming along their armour. The word bearer's voice left his lips in an awed, vicious whisper. You... you are not Fulgrim.